right. Welcome. We're going to be covering UI today. So we should be already like working on a lot of our like core like game principles and our like objectives and things. And a lot of that is also going to be a big part of UI too, because a lot of games they use UI to show um, like different indicators or text to players or like let players like interact or change any settings. Um, things like that. Um, so UI is a really big part of games just to show you how or um, like show what kind of different aspects you could like tweak. Gives like another set of control. Oops, I gotta click here. So some announcements. Our game jam is next weekend. This will be really good if you guys have been following through with this class for, for a while. Um, you'll have a lot of the tools you already have in, a, in order to participate in that and actually like go in and make a game. So you guys won't be able to go in there like completely new. You'll have some good experience. Um, we also have an Unreal workshop um, on March, the second of it. Um, it's gonna be Monday at 7 p.m. So it's like the normal meeting times where our projects meet. There will just be an Unreal workshop instead. And of course our offers applications are open. So you guys can go to that link if you guys are interested. So let's talk about the Unity Canvas system. So the Canvas system in Unity is what uh, Unity uses to host its UI. Essentially, it's, uh, the Canvas itself is a game object that you put into your scene, and all UI elements are going to be uh, children of that Canvas. So like, the Canvas's primary job is to scale UI to the screen. So when you change screen size or screen resolution, it's the Canvas's job to make sure that the UI is fit properly and anchored properly. So like uh, as a recap, two roles, it holds UI and it also scales UI. So once you, to add a Unity canvas, um, you just add like any other game object, you would just right click your hierarchy and you can create a canvas object. Um, another way to do it is also just um, right click your hierarchy and hit UI and um, that's where you can find the canvas, but that's also where you can find other UI elements. If you create any UI element, it's going to automatically create a canvas for you. So um, you don't really have to worry about creating canvas explicitly. Just create, just start making UI, and the canvas will automatically appear. So when you create a canvas, it's going to come with a couple of components. The first one is going to be the canvas component. This one. Um, this component is in charge of how everything is going to scale depending on screen. The key thing of note is the render mode. This um, changes how things are scaling itself. We have the first one is so um, how is the canvas actually like shown onto your screen? Is it's render mode so it's default to screen space overlay, which means um, what overlay means is just that. It doesn't matter where the camera is or what the camera is doing. The UI is just always going to be plastered onto the screen. So like, it's independent of all cameras. Um, players can move wherever they want, but it's again, it's an overlay. Um, screen space camera is essentially it is on your camera. Um, so the way cameras work in Unity is they they sort of have like this view like frustrum. Uh, Essentially, it's, it's more of like a trapezoidal, pyramidal um, like cone in front of the camera. And if you have screen space camera mode on, then the way the canvas works, where it renders UI based on distance of that. So if you would imagine like your camera and your canvas or your UI as like a plane on that, in this mode, you can essentially change like the distance um, away from like the front of the camera. So what you can do with this is that it's still a flat plane, but you can make it a little bit farther back or a little bit forward, um, whereas screen space overlay is always in the front. Um, and this is also different from world space. So screen space, screen space camera would follow the, the camera, but in world space, it would treat the UI as something a part of the scene. So it would actually be like a plane in the scene, and so when you move the camera around, the UI will not follow. 
Um, another component is the scalar component. This is, this is how um, the canvas scales UI to fit different screen resolutions. The default is set to constant pixel size, and this means that all UI elements um, take up a specific pixel size, and it'll stay that way, depending. Like, it doesn't matter what screen you're using, it's going to keep that pixels. So if like your button, or for example, is only like 100 by 100, if you scale to a bigger screen, like that has higher pixel count, then that button would be like really tiny. Um, this is mostly not preferable because when you're scaling to different machines, you want your UI elements to be pretty consistent. So what I usually do is scale with screen size. And this makes, um, this makes it in relation to a specific screen. So it has like a reference resolution, as you can see. And essentially, when that resolution changes, like if you're going to like a 1920 by 1080 machine or like a mobile machine, it will keep that, that resolution in mind and scale everything like percentage-wise, um, like based on how the resolution changes, essentially. And very similarly, constant pixel size sort of works. Um, Sort of the same way as pixel size, but instead of pixels, we're just using more, um, more like physical measurements, like millimeters, um, and it's based on like the DPI of your screen. But again, scale with screen size is mostly the way to go. Um, so when you create a canvas, you want to also have an event system. Um, it's usually it's made automatically once you do create um, a UI element. Sometimes if you just create just a canvas by itself, it doesn't make an event system, but um, you, it should be under the UI menu of when you're creating objects, and then you should be able to spawn an event system also. Cool. Cool, and then that was just the introduction to the canvas. Everything clear so far? Cool. So the UI objects themselves. So the canvas, again, is a container, but the UI objects are what is contained by the canvas. Um, these, there's like various different types. If you guys are on Unity right now, you can check under UI menu. There's a bunch of different um, UI elements you can spawn, like buttons, sliders, text, um, things like that. And they're anchored to their parent object. So what this means is that their scale is going to be based on what their parent is. And you're going to be able to change those anchors later on, which I will be showing you. Um, so here's just like an example of like hierarchy um, with the UI. This is sort of supposed to be like a little simple main menu with Unity default um, UI. So as you can see, we have the canvas in the hierarchy and the panel. And then in that panel, the panel is the one that has like that gray background. And then in that panel is our buttons and our text. So one thing you might notice once you create any of these um, UI objects is that the transform component is a little bit different. It's called a rec transform this time. And that's because it is different. It works, um, it works based, again, like I talked about. It's anchored to the parent object. So for example, there are fields here like position x and position y. These are, um, these are in relation to that um, x, x um, anchor. This one is a, this one might be an outdated a screenshot of the actual like rec transform, but essentially there's like a left component and a right component, and that just means that that's how far it is. It's a measurement of how far it is from the anchor point. So there's going to be like a left anchor, and um, let's say 98 was the left position. It'll be like 98 uh, units away from that anchor point. And of course we have the anchors, which is the reference point that we want on the parent, which We'll be going more in depth in the next slides. And the pivot, which is where the center of rotation is. So here's like a quick overview of anchors. Those like little triangles are the anchor points. Um, as you can see, um, this is from like the Unity documentation slides itself. So it's, it was pretty cool that they have these animations. But essentially, each of those an triangle anchors are, correspond to one corner of your UI element. So since these anchors are like centered onto a single point, which they don't always have to, um, once the, if, when that point moves, this whole UI element moves with it. Um, same thing on this side. It's going to be the bottom right corner in this case. So when that bottom right corner moves, then the button moves. But if you move the left side, then the button would not move. 
And here is not just a single point, it's actually spread out on that bottom, that bottom line. So essentially when the window spreads out or extends, then the button will also um, scale accordingly. And you can also do percentage base too, where if you want the button to take up like uh, about two thirds of the screen or something like that, then you could set those anchors accordingly. So the button will always maintain that percentage of the screen. So changing anchors, um, as you saw on the other slides, you can just click on those triangles, move them around, or you can use presets on the um, inspector itself. It's pretty easy to move around. Cool, and now we're gonna go more in depth of the objects itself. Um, any questions on anchors? Nice. Cool. So the first one is probably the most boring one. It's a panel. This is like the canvas is a container, but what changes it from the canvas is that um, for one, you can resize it. The canvas you cannot resize. It is set to whatever setting you have, like if it's in camera space or, or if it's just like scaling with screen size, but a panel itself, you can change within the canvas. So you can make it take, you can like resize it to take like a small like top right of the canvas or anything like that. Um, another difference is that it also has an image. You can see in the editor that it's slightly gray. Um, that's just the default Unity uh, panel like color, but essentially it has an image. You can change it to a sprite if you want, but you can also change the color. So like you can use this in like a lot of menus. You can have like a nice little container like box for your buttons that can be changed. And you can also change this transparency and color too, which a lot of uh, minimalist UIs use a lot of like transparencies. Um, another one is the text. This one is also pretty straightforward. It has a text component where you can type whatever you want and it can also be referenced by your script. So if you reference a text object, you can just use text, the text object name dot text, and then you can equals and set that to whatever you want. This could be used for um, different like sources of information um, what I'm going to be showing you is a timer. Um, if you remember last class, we made like a little timer script. I'm just going to be connecting that to my text object and it's going to display the time of the, of the scene. And ooh, another cool thing is you can import fonts. It, it looks like you can change it, but you can't, it's not that easy to change at first, but you just have to you drag your fonts into your game object, into your project view, and then you'll be able to just drag it into that fonts area. Cool, and here's the example I was talking about. So this is our timer script that we were using um, earlier. This time, as you can see, I have a reference to the text, which is, I just named the timer text. And all I'm doing is I'm just sending it to the game timer. So I'm setting a string with timer and then the game timer itself. If you see that two string F2, what that, that's just like styling. Um, that means it's gonna be, uh, it's a float that's that only shows the last two de or the first two decimal places. That way, it's just not like a cluttered um, long string of de decimal points. And here's an here it is an action. As the time goes down, the timer ticks down, and it's properly shown. Cool. Um, another really big important UI element are buttons. This is going to be one you're going to be using a lot. Um, once you create a button, it's going to actually have a text component with it. Um, but more importantly, it has this button script that you can edit. And this lets you change various options, like at the color of the button when you press it or when you're highlighting it. But more importantly, there's this onClick field. And what this onClick field is, it lets you call essentially any public method in your scene. So when you click that little plus button, this little menu will show up. And you want to drag any game object with the proper script you want, say like the game object or like the game manager. Um, in my case, I just dragged in the canvas because I, I added a script on the canvas itself. And then once you drag that object in there, then you can hit this drop down and you'll be able to select what method you can run when the button is clicked. So uh, like I said earlier, that method must be public or else it's not going to show up. So that's always something to double check if you can't find your method. Oh, and of course, there's a, you can also call multiple methods in there. 
Um, that's a big one. Also, um, there's no direct order on when those methods execute, even though you can see clearly that one method is over another. That's not always the case. So don't, you can't rely on um, an order here. You always have to just think that they're going to run simultaneously. And another UI element will be our sliders. This, like the button, will call an, um, a method, but in this case, it's on value changed. So sliders come with a bunch of like child components, but essentially, though, as a whole, it just works as, um, as you would think, as a normal slider. You just slide a handle around, and it changes a value. In most case, in this default case, it's from 0 to 1, and it's a float value inside. And you can easily get that also via script. And the on value change is what you're going to be using a lot, especially if you use sliders for like your menus or options. You want to call on value change, or it's going to automatically be called when you change it. And it's going to change like your volume or things like that. Um, one way that I like to use it that's sort of not how it's like intended or like initially intended to be used is as a health bar. Because um, instead of having our slider change a certain like aspect, we have this time our health change the slider itself. So in this case, our slider, you can't actually interact so the players aren't able to drag on it, but we're just going to be using scripts to change how the slider looks. Um, yeah, in this case, we also disable that handle that you saw, because since the player can't interact with it, we don't really need that. Um, we quick, like just a really s small uh, script. It, this is going to be in our player health script. When the player's health change, which in our case is just our add health method, it's just going to take the percentage of that based on the base health, and then it's going to change the value of the slider. And as you can see, the handle is disabled, and we're not really using on value changed. Everything is basically default there. And here's how it looks when the enemy shoots at the player. The health bar just ticks down. Cool. And we also, another component we're going to talk about are the input fields. These essentially, um, if you worked with like a lot of, um, especially like Android Studio or things like that, you can essentially just type in any input here, pretty straightforward. And then um, when you hit enter, I believe is the default, or you can also set a key yourself in your script. You can get the text pretty easily, just like a normal text box, and manipulate that however you will. You, I think in our case, we made like a very simple uh, chat where you type in a message, you press enter, and it shows up in the console. Um, yeah, essentially, we're just we're we're this time we're getting that return key, and we are just clearing it and also saving that um, string. Cool. And next section is going to be for manipulating UI itself. We sort of talked a little bit about manipulation with anchors, but this is not really more so of the movement on this first part, but it's going to be of like visibility. So one way to change what UI is visible is just to disable it or enable it. And in the inspector, we would do that manually by just pressing that check mark. And that just like hides it or um, shows it. But in your script, you would use this method right here. Uh, you would find your reference to the game object, and then just do set active, and then true or false. Um, yeah, and here's a simple like panel switch script, which if you're going to be making like a pretty nice like main menu or just any menu that can like switch through different panels, this is how you would do it. You would have your two panels um, or multiple if you have multiple, but for in this case we were just doing two. Um, we remember what panel we're on with this this bool, and when this is called, probably with like a button press or on clicks, it would call this, and then it would switch what panel is on at a time. And something cool that um, we sort of didn't cover before, but this is an, these are both of these are also mono behavior methods. So if you remember, we have our like update, fix, update, start. There's also on disable and on enable, which when we're calling, when we're setting these enabled or disabled, will be called. So if you if you have any like scripts that you want to run on those specific 
events, this is where you want to do it. Also, another key thing for um, UI in, and visibility, or, or like in layering in this case, actually, is in the hierarchy itself, um, the UI that are like under, if they're like parented by the same object, right? The UI at the bottom will appear on top. So and before in like the actual game view, you would change like that or sorting layer. In this case, it's just where they are in the hierarchy. Um, this is something to also be careful about is panels, since they can take up like a whole like screen or portion of the screen, they can cover a button essentially. So I would pay attention to your order because a lot of the times I put like a panel for like just for like a background, but apparently it's over a button or even when it's just like invisible. Um, it still covers the button and the player can't click the buttons if um, something is covering it, essentially. And um, we can also use the animation system in your UI. So if you remember, we used the animation system before to essentially um, change like sprite animations. But like I said before, you can also use it for movement too, since it's like it has that record feature. You can record um, specific movement, like a UI going down or up. And this could be used just like, it, it, this is more of a polished kind of thing, just like to make smooth UI transitions instead of just like a screen like just appearing. You can have it sliding or fading in. And uh, here's just an example of that from Unit 108. Um, the menu just like slides down, and then different elements are like fading in and out. And yeah, that, now we can go to designing. Yeah. And these lectures are gonna be a little bit shorter now since we've already covered a lot of the core components, but yeah. Go ahead, awesome, so I'm gonna be covering um, designing UI and uh, feedback loops. So um, there's quite a bit, quite a few principles that go into uh, game dev UI. So um, at its core, um, UI should tell the player what they need to do and then move out of the way so that the player can do what they need to do. Um, so these are like some um, good questions to ask yourself when designing UI. Um, does this interface tell me what I need to know right now? Um, if a game isn't telling you what you need to know at a particular point in time, it's really bad to play. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, is it easy to find information that I'm looking for, or do I have to like look around for it and look in uh, various areas? Um, this is sort of just like ease of use for menus. Um, you want your menus to be like pretty self-explanatory. Um, the player shouldn't be spending more time looking through the UI than actually playing the game. Additionally, um, can I use this uh, like sort of environment interface without having to read instructions? Um, this is especially important in like modern games. Back in like early 2000s, people actually read instructions for games, but nowadays everything's supposed to be intuitive, so best be making an interface intuitive. Um, are the things I can do on the screen obvious? A good question to ask because you want your game to uh, have gameplay elements that are obvious, at least in terms of core mechanics. Um, do you ever need to wait for the interface to load? So basically this question is basically uh, talking about the concept of always loading your interface first. That way you never have to, the player never feels bogged down by the interface, but rather by like a loading screen or something like that. Um, and are there any like tedious or repetitive tasks. Basically, can you add in more shortcuts to your UI to make the game um, feel better? So that's like the basic UI principles. So moving on to um, feedback loops. So basically what feedback, feedback, ah, feedback loops are, are how a game rewards its players. So the first and most common is a rewarding feedback, uh, feedback loop and negating. So basically what these look like is they look like a um, sort of um, x squared uh, situation um, or a negative x squared situation uh, in a graph. And basically what this means is you can think of this as um, like kill streaks in Call of Duty. So basically, when a player gets a kill in Call of Duty, it counts towards its kill streak. And when they get three kills, they get some special item 
airstrike haven't played call of duty in a while but um that's the general idea so it's easier for them to get kills so they're getting rewarded in an sort of exponential sort of way where um it becomes easier and easier for them to play the game whereas uh, in Call of Duty, if you keep dying, you're feeding other people's kill streaks. So that's where the difficulty would look like a negative x squared um, curve. So um, those sort of things can feel like really good for the team that's team person that's winning. These loops most often come up in multiplayer games because they're the ones that um, traditionally revolve around balance. But they can feel really bad for a losing team because it feels like the experience is just getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, happens in like games like League of Legends and uh, like Dota, CS:GO, all sorts of games. Then there's um, countering feedback loops. So countering feedback loops are basically when a player gets to a certain height in terms of positive feedback, um, the game um, artificially creates negative impact uh, or negative feedback to punish the player for being too good at the game. Um, the most like classic example of this that everyone's probably experienced is um, Mario Kart. When you're in first place, um, the items you pick up from like the spawners um, throughout the game are like pretty terrible. But when you're in last place, you get like super overpowered um, like items, and that's kind of what uh, causes the curves to like balance out on both sides. So when you're at the bottom, you get crazy items that allow you to boost up and make you feel less bad. Whereas if you're winning, you get like terrible items and certain items even target just you. So yeah, those are countering uh, feedback loops. And then um, there's a lot of ways where you can like sort of reimagine uh, feedback loops and make them go in counter, uh, in directions that counter these two um, common feedback loops because games have uh, traditionally been static and have held to uh, these two principles of loops for a really, really long time. Um, so like a great game that sort of reimagines these loops is like Pyre. So what Pyre does is when you've won um, a set amount of games, uh, Pyre is like a, um, sort of like single player battle arena basketball sort of game. It's a really good game, you should check it out. Um, but basically what it does is after you've won a few games, uh, you uh, every game your characters increase in experience, but you lose the character that has the most experience after a certain amount of games if you uh, won enough games. And that forces you to then use other characters who have different abilities. And it forces you to learn new styles of play rather than just continually snowballing. But it also doesn't necessarily do it in a negative way through the way it tells its story. Um, so it doesn't necessarily feel bad that your character uh, you can no longer play. But it feels like a sense of accomplishment that you've um, been able to get to that peak. And now you're falling down from that peak and you have to struggle to get back to that peak again. Um, like that's one really good example of reimagining uh, feedback loops. And it sort of counters the problem that games like XCOM sort of have. So in XCOM, you also have to like level up characters, but when that character dies, you lose them forever. So if you've um, been like absolutely snowballing on, our, on at the top of a huge like um, rewarding uh, sort of loop, um, you get cut out of that loop and you fall like to uh, like an inverse loop where it's completely negative and that sort of gameplay is like really frustrating and it just um, it does not really reward players with chances to um, sort of overcome difficulties so um, yeah there's different ways to reimagine feedback loops and if you can reimagine feedback loops in like um, a way that really uh, pushes the player to um, figure out new ways to play your game, it can open up a lot of content uh, for the player. And it's generally a good thing. So yeah, that's the question. Um, so for those graphs, like, is that, or like the x-axis, like time, and then why is that rewards? Um, so in terms of um, like this graph, mm -hmm. the um, x-axis would be time. And the y-axis would be like a uh, position in a game, like position as in sort of like placement, like, oh, am I doing good, great, or just like flat out neutral even? So yeah, that's, that's what the um, 
axes mean? I didn't put in an example of negative reward, uh, like a negating feedback loop. I should probably do that. But would it look similar just going the opposite Yeah, it would just look like this. Yeah. Also, uh, make sure to fill out officer applications. Uh, podcast people, too. <laughs> uh, we're always looking for more officers. Uh, game Jam next week. Check it out. Yeah. yeah. So for next week's lecture, um, we're going to be covering progression and safe states. Um, it's going to be a lot more technical than this one since I've done like a lot of safe states, so I'm going to be covering a lot of actual code on like sort of step by steps on how you can actually implement a safe um, state and like save like progression on the game. So I recommend coming to that one, and that's going to be our last one before our like showcase and polish class. Cool. So I'll see you guys then.